Let's talk about Viking axes. Hey folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiator. Now the first thing I want to say is this isn't going to be an exhaustive video just about axes. It's more about the context of axes. That is, did the Vikings in the so-called Dark Ages, in the early medieval period, did they actually use axes any more than anyone else? And why did they use axes? Or maybe why did they use axes? Because we can't definitively know the answer to that question. So we're going to look a little bit in this video, not just at Vikings incidentally, but also people like Anglo-Saxons and Franks and Longobards. Did they use axes? Um, examples of types of axes that they used. What context did they use axes? And why, this is the important part, why might they have used axes instead of swords, because swords were pretty much the dominant uh, close combat, if we're putting spears aside, because spears were always the most common hand combat, you know, close combat weapons. But if we're talking about really close in um, combat weapons, shorter than spears, then swords seem to have been across Europe more common than axes. And I think it's fair to say that in the public mind's eye, axes are very much associated with Vikings or the Norse and so much so that in fact when we look even in the fantasy genre when we find uh, peoples of fantasy environments whether it's barbarians or dwarves or whatever who are very clearly influenced in the terms of their arms and armor and equipment and perhaps even culture to some extent um, they are often associated with axes axes are often associated with these barbarian types and sometimes they're big giant axes and we'll talk a little bit about these so-called dane axes notice the clue in the name there dane from denmark vikings okay um, um so we're going to look at why were axes associated with the norse or vikings in this period is that correct and why possibly might they have used axes instead of swords. But before we get into some really deep penetration on the subject of Viking axes and Dark Age combat, we first want to have a little word from my sponsors for this video, who are Raid Shadow Legends. Have you taken down the Demon Lord yet or crushed the Ice Golem? Have you ascended the Doom Tower or fought against millions of real life opponents in the arena? Well, if not, now's the time to try out Raid. With hundreds of artifacts and over 500 champions to use, you can play Raid your own way and build your perfect team. Use my link below to download Raid for free now to your PC or mobile phone, or you can use the QR code. Now Raid is famous for its incredibly badass bosses who look awesome. First up we're going to look at the Fire Knight, whose real name is Fyro the Infamous. He was once a proud knight of Volcar, but committed regicide at a peace summit with the Frost King. His main defense is his awesome magical shield, which protects him from debuffs, so you need to use characters who've got multiple attacks to get past his shield. You could try using Arbiter, the Apothecary, or Coldheart. Next up, let's look at Princess Avila, the guardian of the magic keep. She's a great example of succumbing to temptation. Believe it or not, she encountered a magical hedge which promised her great power in exchange for souls. So she was like, yeah, whatever, okay, let's take lots of souls from here and there and everywhere until she became so evil that she had to be locked up in the magic keep just to control her. Miz in defeating her that she's got so many bucks. You could try using Madame Ceres or maybe Paidma. Whoever you choose to use, good luck, you're gonna need it. What I love most about Raid is diving into those dungeons and trying to improve my times to get better rewards. I love playing person versus person battles in the arena, and I also love upgrading my champions and making my team more hardcore. This month, Raid has got a jam-packed schedule full of new events to kick off the summer, as well as a load of new content. And as always, they've got a bunch of brand new champions coming out, and every single one of them looks absolutely badass. I mean, just look at these guys. There's also a new rotation of the Doom Tower, which I definitely want to finish this month. So I'm going to be trying to summon as many of these new champions as possible to see if they can help me reach the top. Raid's always got tons of new things going on and this month is no different, so check it out now. If you want to get a huge head start in Raid, then all you've got to do is click the link in the description or scan my QR code and you'll get an epic hero called Chonaru, who's amazing in the Doom Tower. 200k silver, 1 XP boost, 1 energy refill and 1 ancient shard, so you can summon an awesome champion as soon as you get into the game. All this treasure is going to be waiting for you up here in the inbox and these rewards are only available for new players and only for the next 30 days. You can find me in game under the name Captain Context and if you're quick enough you can join my clan. And it's that easy, free to play, free to download, click the description or scan the QR code and I'll see you in game. So thanks for sticking with me and now back to the main subject of this video which is Viking axes. Were they used by Vikings any more than anyone else?
Uh, why were they associated with Vikings? What context were they using? And why possibly may the Vikings have p had a particular like for axes and used them, uh, not to the exclusion of, but alongside swords and spears? And why might they have used them more than other people? Now, the first really important piece of context to mention is what was the arms and armour generally being used in this period and indeed by the Norse. Um, I will try and refer to them more as Norse than Vikings because the term Viking is a little bit problematic. In period sources, certainly in English sources, they're usually referred to as Danes, Norse, whatever like that. Occasionally the word Viking is used, but uh, as I say, that's a more problematic term. But obviously in the modern mindset, everyone knows what a Viking is, but I'll say Norse. So um, the fact is that we very much associate axes with the Norse. Is that correct? Well, there is actually quite a lot of artistic and archaeological evidence to back that up. And indeed, in contrast, when we look at other places, if we look at Anglo-Saxon England or Frankish France or Northern Italy, certain, certainly after the early migration period, axes aren't particularly common. So uh, the context in terms of uh, what the arms and armour generally being used in this period was. So if we put the axe aside for a minute, we've basically got a variety of um, swords being used, which are all roughly similar to this example here. They have a minimal handguard. They have a usually a T-shaped junction pommel and they are reasonably long. They're longer than uh, most Roman swords. Um, certainly they're as long as a long cavalry sword from the Roman era, a spatha. Um, so they've usually got between about 28 and 32 inch blades, fairly long for the period. They're made of good steel and a lot of effort went into the making of swords with pattern welding, uh, hardened carbon steel edges. And if you were super um, uh, lucky, then you could get your hands on a crucible steel sword like a Northbert sword. So they put a lot of effort into making long sword blades. And you'll notice that they have what we often refer to as a spatulate tip. They are pointy. You can stab things and people with them, uh, but they're not particularly pointy. Certainly if we compare to a 15th century sword, for example, from the era when they're trying to stab between the gaps of armour, um, in this period, most swords seem to be broad, what many people would term slashing type blades. So they are broad cleaving blades and they're not really specialised for thrusting. And certainly if we look at the armour of the day, I'm wearing at the moment pretty much the most armour that most people, certainly in Northwest Europe, uh, so the area is mostly being raided by, raided by Vikings, um, would be wearing. That is a male shirt known as a uh, Horbergian, usually. Some type of people might call it a Horbuck. Horbuck's kind of longer than this. A shield of various sorts. Some people say, Matt, your Viking shield's not big enough. Well, that's because it's not a Viking shield. It's an Anglo-Saxon shield. Um, and Anglo-Saxon shields, according to the burials, are somewhat smaller than Viking shields. Viking shields are often up to about 95 centimetres across. Um, Anglo-Saxon shields tend to be smaller than that. And if we look at the Frankish sources, and indeed some Anglo-Saxon sources, it seems that not all of them were flat. This is a flat shield, which is indeed like what most of the shields that have been found from Scandinavia um, alike from uh, ships and burials and indeed most of them from Anglo-Saxon England. So most shields were made of boards um, put together covered in leather with a iron steel boss in the middle held centre boss gripped. So they're not held with straps they're held with a bar in the centre either made of wood or metal. Um, and pretty much most shields across Western Europe were made in this way but as I say not all of them were flat particularly in Francia some of them were conical, and it does seem that conical shields became popular in England as well. In fact, are even shown on the Bayer Tapestry. So some of these, most of these were flat. Certainly the Viking or Norse ones uh, would have been mostly been flat. But in other areas, sometimes they were smaller, sometimes they were conical. Um, and finally, on the head, you'll notice I have an iron, in this case mild steel, but in period mostly iron, um, helmet. Now helmets came in a few forms, uh, but they don't vary enormously if we're looking across world history of arms and armour. Let's put the shield down for a second. Generally speaking, they're suspended on the head with, um, they're not padded inside so much as suspended inside, so the steel is actually away from your head, which is cooler. Um, and this is made of um, steel sheets. Some of these would have been made of various parts, known as a spangen helm, usually four parts, four segments, then with a crossbar over the top. This is a later period one forged out of one piece of steel with an integrated nasal. 
some uh, at the beginning of the uh, so-called Viking era, um, some um, helmets actually have some facial protection as well. Sometimes cheek pieces, particularly in England, um, some of the known helmets from England have cheek pieces like the Coppergate helmet. A few have something down the back to protect the nape of the neck, including sometimes a male uh, kind of hanging skirt at the back, like a curtain. Um, uh, a lot have a nasal, but not all of them. Some don't have anything at the front, some just are fully open faced. And some, the famous uh, kind of, um, uh, what should we call spectacle helms, that go by various names, but the famous helmets associated with Vikings or Norse actually have a couple of uh, kind of plate here with two cutouts for the eyes, which look a bit like spectacles, which obviously protects about half the face. So to cut a long story short, this is about the maximum amount of armour that most people in Western Europe at this time uh, would have worn. I say Western Europe because if we go to the Byzantine Empire, we do indeed find people with more armour, debatably with a lamella sometimes over the uh, male, certainly in the later periods sometimes more complete forms of helmet or more encased forms of helmet. But if we're talking about Anglo-Saxon England, if we're talking about Frank Frankish, what's now France, the Frankish Empire, Carolingian Empire, all of whom were fighting the uh, Norse a lot, and if we're talking about Scandinavia itself, the majority of helmet, uh, the more, majority of armour is a male shirt, pretty much nothing else on the arms and legs except for maybe some type of uh, arming clothes, although for the most part there's not really any evidence for anything like a gambeson in this period. Um, and then some form of helmet which usually is relatively open-faced and relatively open-sided, but sometimes less so, sometimes with a uh, ocular plate, sometimes with cheek plates. So that being the context, this being the armour, mail shirt, helmet and shield being pretty much the most armour that people are going to encounter. But it's very important to mention that the way that I'm equipped white right now would put me into the category of really a very well equipped Anglo-Saxon in the time of say Alfred the Great, in fact this helmet's a later design, but if we say uh, you know the the, the um, kind of 800s, 900s through to Ethelred's time, then this is pretty much the standard equipment of a well equipped English soldier. Now in terms of weapons, if we're in England or if we're in France or Germany, then the typical sidearm, that is the weapon I wear by my side in a scabbard and a belt, is going to be a sword. Whereas uh, the typical primary weapon in my hand is going to be some form of spear. Now this is a particularly uh, large-headed winged spear. Most spears have much smaller heads than this and are much lighter and indeed are longer. Uh, so this is a relatively short and stout uh, example of a spear, but nevertheless this type of spear was around in period and was also used. So essentially your primary weapons are shield, spear, and then a mail shirt and a helmet. And your primary sidearm, for most people, is a sword. Now, let's get back to the subject of the Norse. In actual fact, for the well-equipped Norse would have very, very similar equipment to this. And in many cases, the equipment would actually be taken from people they fought against. So we know that Frankish swords... Uh, which what was then the Frankish Empire were, covered what's now France and Germany and the countries in between. And we know that a lot of swords were made, they're very good quality swords that found their way to Britain and found their way to Scandinavia. And indeed, further afield, they found their way as far as Africa and the Middle East and all over Russia. So, um, very often the weapons and equipment that the Norse warriors had was exactly the same as the weapons that their Frankish or Anglo-Saxon opponents had because those weapons had come from those places. So if we look in Norwegian graves, we can literally find English swords. We can find English silver coins. We can find Frankish items, jewellery, sometimes axes and, um, and swords. So the simple fact is that many of the weapons used by the Vikings or used by the Norse were the exact same weapons that they had either bought or one in conquest from their enemies. So then the question has to come, why do we um, make this assumption, if it is an assumption, that the, the Norse used axes more than other people in Europe? Well, the fact is that the evidence actually supports it. So um, I'll just grab a Dane axe to illustrate the point. Um, so we do have written sources, we've got archaeological sources, and we've got art sources. Okay, so when you're 
a student of this period, you're relying on the text, you're relying on the archaeology from the ground, and you're relying on art. And all three of those things can support the fact that Scandinavians, commonly known as Vikings, did use axes more than most people they encountered. Now, at that point, I just want to make a slight tangent to mention the people they encountered using axes. So the Franks are famous for using the Francisca, which is a type of throwing axe. The Longobards, certainly in the migration era, earlier than this really, a couple of hundred years earlier, were famous for using a type of axe with a hammer on the back, and you find, sometimes find this type of axe elsewhere as well. Sometimes you find it in English graves, sometimes you find it in Frankish graves. Um, and indeed you find axes elsewhere as well, and even if we look at the Anglo-Saxon art, um, certainly from the Viking era onwards, you, you do see axes featured as well. But that's an important point because in England, England was repeatedly conquered by the Norse, by the Danes, um, most famously Canute, for example. And so this, what I'm holding here, is a Dane axe, as it's commonly called today, probably more correctly termed a great axe. But in fact, these types of axes are most featured um, in art, most famously on the Bayer Tapestry, which is obviously um, a, uh, an episode from English history. Or is it? Well, it's more complicated than that, because prior to the Wessex kings returning to the throne, to, to, in a way, through Harold Godwinson, although he wasn't really uh, royalty, um, he claimed the throne. Um, prior to that, there had been a series of um, Norse of Danish kings, okay, from Canute and, uh, and so on. And in fact, this was a hangover from them. So the, it does seem from the sources available that the royal bodyguards from Canute's time onwards carried these big two-handed great axes. And so these were a Viking thing. Moreover than that, we have some archaeology, some very compelling archaeology from London. So London was repeatedly, like many uh, English cities, was repeatedly raided and attacked uh, sometimes successfully, sometimes not incidentally. The, 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 the raiders, the Norse raiders weren't always successful. In fact, very often, about 50% of the time, they were not successful and they were driven off and defeated. Um, and one of these unsuccessful times, they attacked London Bridge. Now, London Bridge, don't imagine Tower Bridge. Don't make that mistake, like that famous American who bought the wrong bridge. London Bridge, at this point, wasn't a stone bridge, as far as we know. It was purely wooden construction, okay? And at this time, the River Thames was narrower and deeper, so it didn't have to span such a wide distance. And um, the wooden bridge was attacked by um, Norse raiders in ships, and they attempted to basically assault the bridge, and the bridge was defended by the Londoners, by the Anglo-Saxons, who fought them off ultimately. But at that site in the Thames, um, there are a series of what are believed to be Norse weapons, which have been discovered from the River Thames, including a whole bunch of these, and they're now in the Museum of London. We've looked at those previously in other videos. So we have actually a lot of evidence that these big great axes were something associated very much with the, the uh, Viking attackers in England. Um, and it goes further than that, in fact, because we have texts. We have texts describing um, the Norse using axes. We also have um, the, the Norse sources such as they are, things like the Icelandic sagas, um, but also additionally we have the names of people recorded. Eric Bloodaxe. Surprise, surprise, Eric Bloodaxe probably used an axe. Um, we additionally have archaeology in Scandinavia, and archaeology in Scandinavia, primarily from graves, from burials, from pre-Christian uh, burials, does show a presence of axes. Now, in terms of the axes, don't imagine that they were all massive two-handed great axes like this. In fact, these are statistically are not terribly rare, but they are a minority. The vast majority of axes in use actually were quite small, okay? Were things like this, and some of them were a bit bigger, like this. So we've got bearded axes and various other types of axes, and there are axe typologies if you want to learn more about Scandinavian axes of this period. So we've got everything from a kind of tomahawk size all the way through typical kind of battle axe sizes, all the way up to massive great axes. So there's a big variety of axes just from Scandinavia. So therefore, we've got text, we've got written history that backs up the Norse using axes. We've got archaeology backing up that they used lots of axes. And we've got, um, we've got a variety of types that are shown in art as well that we also find in archaeology and written texts. 
So I think we conclude, can conclude that indeed the Norse or Vikings did indeed use a whole bunch of axes. Did they use axes more than the people they were fighting against, against um, in this period? I think on balance of evidence, yes. If we look for this sort of preponderance of axes in Anglo-Saxon England or Frankish France or Germany, do we find it? No, not really. What we find, in fact, are loads of swords. So the question is, why? Why did the Vikings or the Norse use axes to such a large degree, seemingly in preference to swords, or was it? Well, I want to answer that first bit first, because I have seen a lot of people over the years, when I've made videos talking about this era and these sorts of weapons, express to me the point that is a valid point on paper, that indeed to make a sword is a huge amount of work and a huge draw on your resources, whereas to make something like an axe, especially a small axe, is really quite easy. Okay. Now, the first thing I want to say is yes, that's absolutely true, and I don't disagree with that point, and that might be a valid point. It might be that for some reason, due to resources, trading, whatever, isolationists, the fact that they weren't, they weren't part of the Christian um, interlocking trade networks, and perhaps they found it difficult to import swords in normal ways. We don't know that's the case. We do also know that they made swords. There were swords made in Scandinavia, very good quality ones. So I'm not fully buying into this argument uh, already, but then we have to add a very important thing when we're talking about the Vikings. You know what the Vikings did, right? <laughs> so I've already mentioned that there are Viking burials. We find them in Ireland, which you've got to bear in mind was essentially a Norse kingdom at that point. Uh, we find them in um, all over Scandinavia, particularly in Norway. And very often those graves contain things that aren't from Scandinavia. They contain things that are from all over the places that uh, Vikings raided, traded uh, and just came into contact with. So the simple fact is they could easily obtain things that were from outside of Scandinavia. And we know this because a lot of the swords found in Scandinavia aren't actually Scandinavian. Many of them are Frankish. Uh, many of them are English. Um, so we know that they could obtain swords. Now, you could still make the argument that only the most powerful people would end up with those swords. Only the richest, you know, the chieftain, the leaders, the thanes, only they would end up with the swords, possibly. But I think it's more than that. I think there was a choice involved. I think they actually chose to use axes more than other people. Now, why might that be? Well, rather than looking at the advantages of the sword, which there are some advantages to it, I'm going to focus on the advantages of the axe and possibly why the uh, Norse, particularly people who went Viking, who were raiding, might have preferred axes. But just very, very briefly, I just want to extol a couple of the chief virtues of swords. So one of the major advantages of swords is the whole thing is a blade. Backwards and forwards will cut and you've got a point. It's difficult to grab, difficult to grapple um, or disarm from someone. So it, it's a very good weapon and it's got good hand protection. Not so much in this era, it has to be said, but still better hand protection than a typical axe. Although that's offset by the fact that you're using a large shield, and when you're using a large shield in the right way, the hand is not necessarily vulnerable. Um, but to me, one of the chief advantages of the sword is it's super easy to wear um, at your side in a scabbard. The way it's balanced, the balance being more towards the hand than the tip, makes it quite comfortable to wear. It doesn't really swing around very much. Um, and it doesn't get in the way, and in a scabbard it's completely safe. So they are very, very good sidearms for wearing. They're big knives, really, aren't they? They're big daggers. So uh, super easy to wear, super easy to have as a backup weapon. And remember that in many cases, whether it's an axe or a sword, that's your backup weapon, that's your sidearm, the thing you wear at your belt. The main weapon is still the spear for pitched battles. So, back to the axe. Why? might lots of Norse have preferred the axe. Well, at this point, it would be only too easy for me to talk a long time about the advantages of axes at smashing shields, at hooking shields, at um, smashing people in armour, and uh, just having an impact damage on helmets, for example. So if you are fighting armoured opponents, an axe is a lot of the time a better weapon than uh, than a sword is, particularly this type of sword, which doesn't have a great piercing point. You can't cut through most armour, certainly can't cut through helmets, you can't really cut through a male shirt. 
and the point isn't going to stab through a male shirt either. Um, so if you're just going to whack someone really, really hard in the male shirt or in the helmet, this is a much better item for the job because it combines a cutting blade with some aspects of a mace. All of the inertia is up at the tip of the weapon. But I'm not going to go into that as the main point. Rather, I'm going to think about how different armies fought. So, if we're looking at Anglo-Saxon England or um, the Frankish Empire, then quite simply, a lot of these armies were geared up to fight other armies. Okay, so you're dealing with spears and shields used in formation in shield walls. Um, and your men are aiming to march for a long distance and then form up somewhere, hopefully in an advantageous position, maybe halfway up a hill, um, and then either defend that position or they're aiming to attack, uh, attack some type of uh, fortification like a burr, for example, which is an earth and wood uh, ramparted uh, area, usually around a town, and this kind of thing. So the, you're aiming, you're equipping your troops to fight pitched battles. But quite simply... <laughs> This often wasn't what the Norse were aiming to do when they were attacking an area. So if you're invading, first of all, you're moving in quick, relatively light ships. In some cases, the ships they would pull out of the water, move across land and dump them in another river somewhere else. So you're aiming to hit and run. Now, in hit and run uh, tactics, a lot of the time you're attacking people who aren't necessarily prepared or ready for it. Now, if we just compare an axe for a second with a sword, most people would accept that a sword is a better defensive weapon. It's quicker, it's more nimble, you can uh, parry with it a little bit better, it can move around a shield um, very nicely. But the axe is basically more offensive. So as a weapon of attack, I would argue that the axe is potentially a more offensive weapon. Some people at this point might argue, oh, Max, Matt, you can also use it as a, as, a, as a tool. Arguably, yes, it depends on the type of axe. Certainly both of these I have cut wood with and they both work perfectly well. Something like the uh, giant great axe or Dane axe is got a very thin blade and you could chop with, wood with it, but you're likely to uh, <laughs> shorten the, the um, usable life, the service life of the axe by doing so because it's really optimised for fighting. So it's a very thin, long fighting blade. But certainly some types of axes could be used as a tool. Also, they could be used for breaking into um, fortresses. Remember, of course, that the Norse a lot of the time were atta attacking church settlements. So if you're trying to break your way into a monastery complex, um, breaking through doors, windows if they've got glass, although not a lot of them would have had at this time, I don't think. Um, but yeah, absolutely. If you're doing that kind of rough kind of breaking into places, destroying stuff, capturing people to sell as slaves. Remember, this was a major part of the Norse uh, Viking operation was capturing humans, particularly in Ireland, uh, famously so, um, capturing humans to sell in the slave trade. Um, but additionally, you know, just, just generally looting and rampaging, an axe will be a good all-purpose kind of thing. But moreover than that, I think it's, it's actually, even in single combat, it's a weapon of great offence. If you're coming up against unarmoured opponents or armoured opponents, this is super, super useful and super, super effective. Now, there is another sort of elephant in the room here. Some of the evidence suggests that very often the... Norse, uh, the Vikings, were not as well armoured as their opponents. Sometimes they may have even chosen not to be because they were trying to be quick moving. And in fact, even if we go to the Battle of Stamford Bridge in 1066, Harold Hardrada's army is described as not having time to put their armour on. Uh, so they did have armour. This is quite a late period in the Viking era, it has to be said. It's the after the middle of the uh, 11th century, so it's quite late in, in Viking history. Um, so they did have armour, but they, had, they were, whatever they were doing at camp or whatever else, they, they didn't have it on. Okay? So they weren't in the process of raiding, they were probably just not ready for battle. But the fact is that uh, if we look at artistic evidence at least, there is some suggestion perhaps that the Scandinavians didn't have as great an access to male shirts, for example, as uh, some of the people they were fighting against. So maybe a weapon, if, they, if you go on the offence, maybe a weapon like an axe is uh, even more appropriate in that scenario because it's a way of just closing and attacking. And it's a very attacking mindset. So 
If you just think about single combat for a minute, a person using an axe and shield against someone with a sword and shield instantly has a very, de- very, very different mindset because this weapon is top heavy. Okay, it's top heavy, but any impact with it is going to be really, really uh, severe on the opponent, as long as you hit the opponent, of course, rather than their shield. A sword, by and large, is much more nimble is much longer, so it's easier to hit the opponent, but when you do hit them, it's gonna have less effect. Yeah, I mean, if you if you hit someone with a sharp sword in the leg, it's gonna take part of their leg off, but you've got to get to their leg, and in fact, legs with uh, shield systems are relatively easy to protect by distance, okay? So it's the upper targets are really easier to get to. So, I regard an axe as a far more offensive and attacking weapon than a sword. A sword, I think, is better overall, But if your prime directive is attacking and completely subduing, almost with a rush, if you imagine the Highlanders of the uh, 17th century, they knew that they couldn't stand and duke it out in a firefight with British government forces, but they knew that if they charged down on those government forces and came to -to hand-to-hand combat as quickly as possible, then they stood a chance. Now, if we look at pitched battles between the Norse and people like the Anglo-Saxons, if we look at the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle and look at the statistics then we'll see that very often in pitched battles, the Norse didn't do particularly well. What they really excelled at was attacking quickly forces that weren't ready, or indeed people that weren't forces at all, attacking civilian settlements and doing hit and run guerrilla warfare. And I think the ax really stands out in this context. So, in conclusion, I would argue that yes, absolutely, the uh, Norse, absolutely did use axes more than other people. Why did they use axes more than other people? I don't think it's to do with resources. I think there was plenty of uh, weapons and uh, armour and silver and money flowing into Scandinavia in this period from numerous sources uh, due to their activities. I don't think it was to do with resources. I think they chose, that's that's the first thing to say, I think that Scandinavians chose to use axes And I don't have the answers for exactly why, but my current thinking, and this may evolve in future, and I would really welcome you to post underneath with your views and thoughts on this subject, but my current thinking is that, yes, they absolutely did use axes more than pretty much everyone else in Europe, and the main reason why is because the type of warfare they'd specialised in, hit and run, quick lightning attacks, almost we could use the term blitzkrieg here, Um, and being very, very offensive. Um, And so I think this was really what they excelled at. And I think when we get all the way to the 11th century, when things like this big great axe were involved, I think what we're starting to see is a specialisation. They have specialised in axes for so long that we're getting distinct different types of weapons. Um, You might have had axes that were more specialised for throwing. You might have had axes which were more specialised for smashing in armour, like big, heavy, thick-bladed, bearded axes. And indeed, specialised axes that were for taking on multiple opponents and occupying a space. Very similar job to the later Montante or Greatsword behind me, um, whereby you can occupy multiple opponents. And of course, at the Battle of Stamford Bridge, we have this famous account of the, um, of the Norse warrior on a bridge, holding off, uh, fending off holding the bridge and fending off a bunch of Anglo-Saxon opponents. He was event- event- uh, eventually stabbed from below with a spear, apparently, allegedly. Um, so I think what we see is such a degree of specialisation in the axe amongst Norse warriors that we see these different types of axes, much how in other places in later centuries we see different types of swords developed for different purposes. What we see in the Viking era are different axes developed for different purposes. But this is something we really only see either in Scandinavia or in the Scandinavian sphere. And I would include England in that because for parts of English history, we were almost, well, we were basically a Scandinavian country under Scandinavian kingship. And just to mention as well, while I think of it, Harold, um, Harold Godwinson himself, often described as an English king, his mother was uh, Danish, I believe. So he was half Scandinavian himself. So um, when we see things like this in the Bear Tapestry and think that is an English house car, well, is it? It's kind of, kind of a Scandinavian house car, really. It might be an Englishman in DNA terms, uh, but culturally, in terms of the weapon he was using, possibly even the fighting style and the tactics, could indeed really have been described as a Viking.
So I hope that's thought provoking. I'm very interested to hear your thoughts on this. Do you agree with me that, uh, that, that axes were indeed exceptionally popular in Viking Scandinavia and amongst the Norse? I think that's undeniable. I think it's pretty well proven in the text, the archaeology and the art. And lastly, why? Why do you think it was? Why do you think the main reasons? It's unlikely to just be one reason, but I think a major reason is their style of warfare. Thanks for watching, I hope you've enjoyed the video and I'll see you really soon on the channel again for another video. Cheers folks!